Today, we will finish reading Acts chapter 2 as we continue to think about that day in the history of the Christian church and the aftermath of that Pentecost day, both then and in now. When it was Pentecost Sunday here a few weeks ago, we read the beginning of Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down like tongues of fire and the sound, the rush of a violent wind, and filled Jesus' disciples so that they walked out into the street and told the good news of God's love to every person who was there, even the ones who spoke a different language. Last week, we read the middle of Acts chapter 2 in a speech that Peter gave to the crowd about the forgiveness that God offers everyone through Jesus. And verse 41 in Acts chapter 2 said, those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day. Incredible. So the verses we'll read now at the end of Acts chapter 2, tell what happened in the weeks that followed. What the group was like now that they had all these new different kinds of people from different places. How did they act when they were together? What did they do when they got together? And most importantly, the question we need to ask today, how can we experience that too? So here's a reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Hear now the word of the Lord. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common, they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. May God bless the reading of this holy word today. So, what an amazing description of a community. How neat. What a fun group that would be to be a part of. So fun that you might actually forget that it was a church. When I led a Bible study on the book of Acts a few years ago at another church, and we read these verses... After I finished reading, I asked, so what do you think of that group there? And the folks in the Bible study said, well, it, they kind of sound like a cult, which is funny, but true, but funny. This group in Acts 2 does sound like what we might consider a cult, more so than what we would think a church would look like. They shared everything they owned. They sold their possessions to have money so every person was cared for. They ate together in people's houses all the time. They spent a lot of time just hanging out and worshiping and praying. And verse 47 said, the Lord added to their number daily those whose lives were being saved. So I think it's very telling that Christians today read these verses and it it doesn't really sound like a church to us, at least not the way we think of church. But this was the first, most purest, holiest, spirit-filled expression of any Christian church ever. And yet it doesn't look like what we today might call a normal church. Maybe it's because in that description there was no mention of business meetings, or committees, or stewardship campaigns, or planning seasonal events, organizing volunteers, or that ever-present need with churches today, building maintenance. Ugh. None of that stuff is in here. 
So it's hard for us to recognize a church when we see it. We get so used to what we're used to and so focused on the pressing need of the moment that it's hard to just go with the Spirit's flow and enjoy the moments. We get so distracted by administrative needs that we often run out of time and money for spiritual needs. But that really is the case with most every church in America today. 50 and 60 years ago during the baby boom time, churches were booming too. So there are many churches in our country today who built new buildings in the 1960s and 70s to handle all the people who were flooding in. And as it turns out, our church did the very same thing. Our beautiful sanctuary was built in the early 1970s because of the boom in growth and church attendance of our community. Since most churches in the country were experiencing that same boom and expansion, some people consider it a golden era for churches in America. Then as the decades passed, the culture changed, yet many churches stayed the same way that they were. So now today churches find themselves in a different predicament. They got used to staying inside their buildings where it's nice. But outside, the outside world might no longer speak the same language. That sound familiar? The Pentecost story can help with that. When Acts chapter 2 started, Jesus' followers, about 120 people at the time, were staying inside with the doors closed. But the Holy Spirit filled them up and pushed them out all they needed to provide was the willingness, and the Holy Spirit took care of the opportunity and the ability. So they were suddenly able to talk with people about God and life, whom they had not been able to talk to before. May the same thing happen to us. But that's the big challenge for churches today, since people talk and communicate differently than they used to. Have you ever got a message from someone who is younger than you and it included an abbreviation that you didn't understand? Yep, yep. And so you don't, you don't tell them, but you secretly have to Google what that abbreviation means so you know what they're talking about. You might whisper, hey, hey, Google, what does SMH stand for? Oh, oh, okay, okay. And we pretend we knew it all the time. But people today just communicate a little differently now. And we can all agree that society is different today than it was 50 years ago. Some of the problems back then have gotten a little better, but there's still a lot of work and improvements that need to happen. And new struggles now exist that weren't around in the past. So every church must ask the question, who are we reaching now and who are we not who is there outside the doors that we are not connecting with because we don't communicate or operate in a way that engages with them if we really want to follow jesus's commands and his great commission then we must Number one, start listening to the people in our community so we can know what they need. Then number two, we must be willing to work and serve in a way that really connects with them. And number three, we must then need to be open to a fresh expression of the Holy Spirit at work through us in the world. A fresh expression is a way of ministering and connecting in a new way, but it cannot be forced. It will only occur naturally through listening to people, serving them, and following the Holy Spirit. That is what our pattern must be. Listen, serve, and follow. So be thinking about these things. How can we listen to the people in our community more? and better.
And then after we have heard what people's spiritual needs are, we do it. Jesus came to serve others, and he said that the greatest people in God's kingdom will be servants. So when we hear what would really connect with people, then we'll know how our service and work can make a difference. We don't want to waste time and energy on things that won't make a difference, but spend good time on ways that connect instead. Listen, serve, and then follow the Holy Spirit into a neat, new, fresh expression of God at work. Because God is all about fresh expressions. It's what God does. God creates. God makes new life all the time. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Ezekiel 36, 26, God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And especially Revelation 21, 5, when from the throne of heaven, God said, look, I am making all things new. That should be exciting to hear. But I admit it can be a little unnerving too, since it means we won't know exactly what the future will be look like will will look like since god is making all things new and and new things can be hard and change is hard and sometimes there's a sadness that comes along with it there was an influential spanish priest in the 1500s who came to be called saint john of the cross his writings and poems inspired many people then and now, and it's from one of his poems that we get the phrase, a dark night of the soul. He's the one who came up with that phrase. In that poem, it narrates the journey of a soul from its earthly home and into union with God. That transition, St. John of the Cross said, it happens during a dark night. And that night time represents how hard it is for us to let go of what we have been holding on to in the world so that we can reach out towards God's light. That kind of night time is not bad, it's not evil, but it can be uh, unsettling to us since we might be nervous about what is happening. When we have times of uncertainty and transition like that, we tend to assume that something is wrong and we want to know how to fix it. But that's not the point of learning from a dark night. It's not about something that's gone wrong and needs fixing. It's about us letting go and leaving behind what we once clung to. And maybe the Christian church today is going through a kind of dark night like that. I'm sure it's been painful for a lot of churches that have had to close down over the last few years. They loved and clung very tightly to the room they were in and they didn't let the spirit blow them out into a fresh expression of God's work so the pain of their dark night was having to let go of their buildings when their church was sold. Another example of a dark night in the soul of churches today might be the pandemic time last year that we all have been living through. It was very hard and very uncertain, but I think it taught us a lot. Like we learned some things reassessed some priorities. That's why I kept saying last year, don't waste this time. It is difficult, but it can be precious and transforming. Maybe it helped us practice doing some letting go of what we had clung to. The pain of letting go of the world is worth it because it frees us up so that our love and devotion for God, 
our relationships and friendships with others are more direct and pure if we let ourselves sit through and change in a dark night of the soul, then we might find ourselves changed so much that we, I don't know, share everything with everyone or sell our possessions to give to anyone who needs anything or get together all the time to sing and eat and pray and talk with glad and generous hearts. Ah, we've heard that description before. When we let God teach and mold us as we let go and change, we are then able to connect with the light of God and with others in new, more direct ways. We're freed to do new things and achieve new things that we weren't able to before because we had kept ourselves limited in our routine. So we step out nervously into a new day's light. That's what we're doing as a society, as the pandemic transitions. We're stepping out hesitantly, awkwardly into what this new day is like. And as a church, we might need to do some trial and error as we figure out what the new day might need to see what is helpful and what is not. I would rather try new things and new ideas that don't pan out than never try anything new at all because it shows that we are open to the Holy Spirit and new movements and fresh expressions. It's easier, though, we admit, to stick with a pattern and not stop to think if there is a better way. But then we would never discover what those better ways might be. For example, in World War II, during the Battle of the Bulge, we were experiencing a lot of casualties. So there were a lot of replacements that were sent over for troops on the front lines. And most of those new replacements hadn't learned all the techniques and routines that the other battle-hardened troops had learned on the field. So one day there was this brand new lieutenant in the 90th Infantry Division who wasn't told how he should take over an occupied enemy house. After D-Day, when troops would find an occupied house, they, they learned that they should sneak up they should throw grenades in the windows. When the grenades go off, they kick the doors down and fire at any enemies they might see inside. But when this new green lieutenant was instructed to capture the first house outside a village that the American forces were moving towards, he walked up to it, he knocked on the door, and he waited for someone to answer. His commanding officer was waiting in the woods aghast and could not believe what he was seeing and thinking, oh no, we're going to lose another officer today. But eventually, a German sergeant in undershirt and suspenders opens the door. The lieutenant says something to him. The German sergeant steps outside and yells. Then a group of Germans walk out of the barn behind the house with their hands up to surrender. Then all of those Germans walk our American soldiers into the village and go house to house, helping all the other German soldiers who were there to surrender to. Isn't that crazy? The company commander that day was John Colby and he said, if our new inexperienced lieutenant had taken that first house properly the way I wanted him to, all kinds of shooting would have broken out with lots of casualties. As it was, no one got killed and we took a hundred prisoners peacefully. Incredible. Sometimes it's the things you don't intend that provide the best reward. Sometimes we find ourselves 
stumbling into new good things by accident. Whether it was the disciples on Pentecost who stumbled into the street when the Holy Spirit blew them outside. Or maybe even like us, when we stumbled into live streaming and recording our worship services last year. And yet, we have been blessed by that. And we are being blessed today. So now, now, instead of continuing to stumble into good things, we can take some good new future steps on purpose. Hesitant, uncertain steps maybe, but excited steps as we continue to get creative about putting God's love into practice for our community in ways that connects with them. So be open and be ready to listen to serve, and to follow. Let's pray. Oh God, we admit that we get so used to the comfort of our room inside that it is hard for us to let your Holy Spirit blow us out into your world to follow the mission that you have for us and to communicate with those around us. It is hard because we know we don't have the ability to do it. So remind us, O oh God, that we don't need to, that your Holy Spirit will give us the ability, the boldness, the power, and the inspiration to do all of the amazing things that you call us to. Help us to do those amazing things, even when we are nervous about them, and to welcome in a fresh expression of your spirit's movement in our world. May we be blessed by that initial discomfort but then transformation and daily joy and gladness and growth inside and out. In your holy name we pray. Amen.